morning. All right. Well, obviously, I'm not Pastor Nick. No surprise there. Um, he's vacationing with his uh, family, and we're hoping that he has a really great time and then enjoys his time away and really recuperates and, and has some restful time. And we pray that uh, his head isn't too big from the Notre Dame win yesterday. If anybody knows uh, Pastor Nick, he's a Notre Dame fan, so uh, I think they won in epic fashion yesterday. Uh, my name is Mark Jones. Uh, I'm a pastor um, right now, kind of between churches, but this is my church. <laughs> Somewhere along the way over the last few months, um, I've got to really know Pastor Nick. Um, if many of you might remember, I preached here on New Year's Day. Actually, I don't think there's very many of you here on New Year's Day, if I remember. <laughs> but uh, either way, uh, uh, I got to know Pastor Nick uh, through, through the course of the last year, and he's really spoken to my life in a private um, you know, one-on-one discipleship kind of setting and mentoring, and, and um, he gave me the opportunity to fill in for him. So I'm really uh, gracious uh, for that opportunity, because I think I've got some really cool things to, to share with you about the last part of my life. Um, and, and, you know, there are certain times in your life where you really learn some thick lessons. I mean, do you, any of you really took some, some big lessons from life on the chin? And there's just a season there, man, where it was like back to back to back, and you were really getting it. And when you reflect back on that time, that's a time in your life where, you know, it wasn't necessarily comfortable, but it was very prosperous because you learned a lot of tough lessons. And that's kind of what I've just kind of walked out of. And from that, um, what I learned to do was to kind of step back from my life for a minute. I'm about to be 38 years old, and I'm sure that some of you in here probably scoff at the fact that I feel like I'm getting old, but... (laughs) 38, you know, at some point in your life, all of you will do this if you're not near there. If you're younger than that, just hold on, it it, it comes. But at some point or the other, you you start to stop counting that direction. You know, when you're 16, you can't wait till you're 18. When you're 18, you can't wait till you're 21. When you're 21, you can't wait for your 25, so your insurance will go down. And you're continually counting and accumulating time. And what I found out we do is, what I've done, especially in this last season, is I've stood back and, and went, man, I'm done with more than I'm going to do from now on. Like, I've done spent all the, more years have expired than are going to expire, more than likely. And, and you start to think to yourself, what have you done with your life? How have you used the years that you've been given? And, and, and for me, um, the answer is, <laughs> really, not very well. I didn't come to Christ until I was 35 years old, so you might as well say 35 years completely given over to sin. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to unpack that. We're, this is all part of the series shift we're going to be concluding today, as you saw the trailer and our buddy, what was his name, Finn? Finn? <laughs> um, the little fish guy. Um, if, I'm here today with my wife, Melissa, and... My little, um, my personal little fish back there, Owen, uh, is a six-year-old. You might see him. He's got like the mohawk. It looks, I think he's got it red today, or is it blue, or I don't know. Sometimes he dyes it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we're here together, and, and um, I, I think that we both learned this message together. This is a message that really hit us on the chin, because what we found out is um, how, how we look at our time is different than God. So if you're on Facebook Live, uh, we want to welcome you, um, and as part of Shift, this is going to be the odometer. Uh, Pastor Nick was talking about the tachometer, and he was talking about the speedometer, and if your tachometer is running wide open, you might be in a lower gear. You're not really producing much, but your engine's running really hard, and, and um, we talked about in week two the uh, temperature gauge, and then we talked about the check engine light. Well, this week's going to be the odometer. We're going to be talking about time as a, as a whole, and... Um, before we unpack all of that, I've, I've got kind of a story that's about time, sort of. This Bible right here is interesting. Um, it's a, just a study Bible, and it weighs about 10 tons, and it's old. <laughs> um, I, about 10 years ago, through a crazy series of events, I'll give you the cliff notes here real quick, crazy series of events that really made me feel alive. And while I'm telling the story, I want you to think to yourself, when's the last time that you felt alive? like really had your blood coursing through your veins, or it was really a moment you know is never going to happen again. Maybe it was the birth of a child. This story with this Bible is, um, I was a, a, in a really bad spot in my life. I was drug addicted and, and an alcoholic and, and um, really just living pretty rotten. And what happened was uh, I got stood up on a date to church. We were living so rotten, we thought we would go to church together and, and kind of nullify some of that. 
and, and I, as if it works that way. Um, and we ended up, I got stood up, and so I went to church anyway. I showed up in the back of the church right when they were getting ready to close. It was like they were giving the closing prayer. I walked in, sat in the back row. The guy comes walking up. He says, hey, man, are you okay? I'm like, no, I don't know what I'm doing here. Maybe that's you today. And, I, and as I sat there, he's like, look, man, come in here. We'll talk. And he began to talk, and we, and we met for six months, and I went through a, a, a drug cleanup program, a rehab program, and, and cleaned up my life. Uh, eventually, I ended up relapsing back. But the, the point of the story is, is I got to know this guy named Jason. And this reason that this is significant is um, about five years later, this was 10 years ago that all this took place. About five years later, my mom comes over and, and, and gives me this Bible. It just, it just in, a, in a random moment, I hadn't seen her in a while. We're kind of, we don't get along. Uh, families are like that. That's just part of it. Um, and this Bible she gave me, on the, the first day I walked back into the church, for the very first time, my son asked me if I wanted to go listen to him sing at Christmas. And so I went to uh, the church with him. And of course, I, you know, I love my son. I'm going to go listen to him preach. And I brought this Bible. And the first person I run into is the last person I seen at church 10 years ago was Jason. Now he's the campus pastor at another church. And I walk in, and this is who I walk into 10 years later. Five years in between there, I had received this Bible. Four or five months later, I'm called to preach. I'm saved. And this Bible, I'm packing with me on my first trip up to the pulpit. Very first message I'm ever going to deliver. And Jason says, man, I'm so proud of what's happened. God's done a great work in you. And I really want to pray with you before you go on stage. And dude, we were teared up and we were bro hugging. And he says, hey, man, you got a MacArthur? Dude, nice Bible. I said, yeah, I've had it for years. He goes, he like pitches his papers over on the desk. And he looks and he says, where did you get that? So my mom gave it to me like, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. He goes, your mom came and was asking about you at my office. We were talking during that six-month period. And I gave her this Bible. I gave her that Bible, and this was the Bible. This is the Bible I preach with now. And the reason I tell you this story is, is because God doesn't operate on our time scale. That blew me away. He gave a guy something 10 years ago that he gave to me that's going to end up on, and here we are 12 years later, and this is my Bible. <laughs> he doesn't operate on the time scale that we operate. And so our time scale that we operate on is right now. Is it not? Are you not acutely aware of what time it is? What time is it right now? I know you guys are like, uh, you've been on the message for seven minutes, <laughs> right? Okay, so what time is it? That's a question that we all answer. It's a question that we worry about all the time. What time is it? You know what time your birthday is. You know your date, your month, your year. You know how long it is until then. You know how long it is in your, your pregnancy. My wife is counting down the moments so she can wear uh, her, her boots and her scarf till, uh, till October really starts. We know... Um, at any time, you could walk up to anybody, you know, I'll say the United States, but basically the world, and they would give you a general approximation of what time it is. You know what day it is? If you don't know what day it is, come see me after service. We'll talk about that. But you generally have a, a sense of what time it is. At all times, we're focused on it. It's, we're so focused on it, I found something really crazy while I was looking for it. So while I was telling you this story about this Bible and, and that time doesn't operate like it does for us, as it does for God. God's the odometer, continually turning over. Some of you, like, haven't had a car with a digital tachometer or a digital odometer. You know, now they're all electronic. But it used to be it's a little rollover. You guys remember this? They had the little, it went from, uh, from zero to eventually to nine, and then the next one would roll over, the next one would roll over. And when it got to nine, 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 what did it do? It rolled over and started again. That's God. And we're going to read about that here in just a second. But we are kind of like the trip, the trip meter. The trip meter. Where it's, it's going to stop somewhere. It only goes to like, you know, it's only intended for you to measure about 70 or 80 miles, maybe what your gasoline tank holds. And, and so if we think about time in that respect. We, we ask what time it is all the time. Here's, here's the problem. This right here, <laughs> this is something I uncovered. This is something we also are aware of, but we don't focus on so intently. This uh, I found, don't go to this website, by the way, holy moly. It's called deathclock.com. And, and you can, you can uh, put in your body mass index and your height, weight, so, so forth, and it'll give you a calculated out a date of your departure from Earth, the, the day that you'll die. This is how many minutes. I've got 1.2 billion seconds left. Um, and if you do the math on that, it gets down. You know, if you start at the top, it's like 20 million minutes. And, and then it's like, you know, 333,000 hours. And then it's like, if you could keep on going down, and you finally get down to where you're like 460 months. 
Whoa. I mean, that's a lot smaller number. I can handle that. 460 months. That doesn't sound like very long. You know, I had a friend who had a kid that was in diapers for 60 months. I was like, oh, that's great. Wait a minute. That's five years. <laughs> Wait, what? You know, you think about it differently than God does, because here's what, here's what the Bible says. We're going to talk, uh, we're going to be in Psalm 90. If you've got your Bibles with you today, um, you can turn there. If you're online, we want to welcome you, man. I've got some friends in Campbellsville that are going to be, um, that are catching us on live feed, so I want to do a little shout out to them. Turn to your Bibles, and, and, and we're going to be going out of Psalm 90. And I'm going to read through some verses pretty quickly here. And, and it's going to give us an idea of what God says about him and time and what we do with time. And this is written by a guy who knows a little bit about time. Because this is a, a, one of the strangest, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not ironic, it's not a coincidence. It's one of the strangest things in the Bible is it's one of the oldest passages that we are aware of that we have in the canon of Scripture. And it's written by Moses. And, and so when Moses was, uh, if you don't know the story, Moses was um, uh, picked up out of the river in a basket and raised up by the Egyptians, but he was Jewish. And so he ended up uh, uh, growing up in, this, uh, in, 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 the, in the palace and so forth, and, 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 and he saw the persecution of his people. And so he felt compelled one day, and he, he killed two Egyptians that were after a guy that were doing something terrible. So he took off, he bolted, and he went out to the wilderness. And how long was he in the wilderness? Everybody knows this one. Forty years. Forty years. He waited. Who's waited for anything like 15 minutes and didn't lose their mind? Have you been in those two lanes at McDonald's? Come on. <laughs> you going to cut a guy off and then, hey, I got to wait an extra car? What? <laughs> 40 years he waited. He, 40 years he waited. And then, the, you know, the, through the burning bush, God comes down. He says, okay, uh, why don't you go tell, set our people free. It's time for y'all to come home. Get out of there. We're going to take you to the promised land. God does some really bad things to a guy that wouldn't answer to him. He said, okay, I'm not going to do what you said. God does some bad things. He ends up bringing the Egyptian or the uh, Israelites out, and then they go across the Red Sea, and they get over here to this other area, and they're kind of waiting to go to the promised land, and how long did they wait there? 40 years again. Okay, so uh, I think what I was reading um, in preparation for this was that uh, they think that Moses may have lived somewhere around 120-something years, I believe. 80 years he waited. Who can imagine waiting two-thirds of their life just waiting for anything? I mean, anything. Waiting for the lottery to show up at your doorstep for 40 years would be impossible. Let alone 80. I mean, you would be, you'd go crazy. He had an idea about what time was about, what it meant to deal with time on God's scale. And he had a perspective, a really, a really serious one on our scale. Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generations before the mountains were born. And you, were brought, and you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Notice it says, um, you are God. Not you were God or you will be God. You are God. It's I am. Okay. Uh, you turn people back to dust saying, return to dust, mortals, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by and like a watch in the night. You, yet, you sweep people away in the sleep of death like they're the new grass of the morning. And in the morning it springs up new, but by evening it's dry and withered away. And our days pass away under your wrath. And we finish out our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. But yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. And they quickly pass away. And we fly away. Wow, thanks, thanks for bringing me to church this morning, honey. <laughs> Boy, that's really encouraging, right? Basically says God lives forever. And guess what? Here's the next thing here. We don't. We don't. So the question should be rather, what, what time is it? Is what are we doing with our time? There's a lot better question to ask than what time it is from somebody. There's a lot better question to wonder about how long it's going to be until this happens or what until this happens. It's what are we doing with the time that we've already got? What are we doing with what we got right now? Here's a couple of interesting things about time that we don't really, we say a lot. Who said, okay, I've got to save some time over here somewhere? Okay, um, maybe you can make up some time. I've got to make up some time. I'm, I'm, I'm behind. We wake up in the morning having to make up time. I know I do. We, we're behind the gun right off the bat, and we're, and we're busy. And we're covered up, and we're doing all these things that really don't amount to a whole lot. I mean, 
I don't know about you guys. I, I like the relevant, simple, and real. I can, I'm real. I'm telling you, I, I get caught up doing things that I just thought I have no idea why I was doing that. And I get done, and I wonder, what in the world? Where did all my time go? What are we doing with our time? How many people in here have had somebody come up to them and say, hey, can I, have you got a minute? When has that ever took a minute? When has it ever taken a minute? Never. It's always 45 minutes. You know, oh, yeah, well, sure. And so when you do that, you take away, you know, what you already committed to, to whatever this is. Um, what are we doing with our time? I think that there's some things that we all do with our time that these aren't going to be shockers to you. These aren't going to be things that are really going to wow you until you tar- start to put them in perspective of the use of time that you're doing in your own life. You know, I, I, one of my favorite uh, quotes is, 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 we're never used, you know, we're never supposed to, to use this as, a, as a, a window to check other people's lives out. We're not supposed to be looking through there going, you waste time. It's a mirror so that we can reflect upon ourselves and say, okay, what am I doing with my time? Because I, I mean, I, I, you married guys in here, it's really easy to point out when you're, um, you know, your older kids are wasting time or your wife is wasting time. Hey, look, there's a lot better way to do that. I'm real critical about doing that. But what if we took that time and kind of reflected upon ourselves? I want you to reflect upon yourself right now. Here's some things that we do. Number one, um, here's a fact about time. If you invest it, if you invest small increments of time into certain areas consistently over time, they add up to something more valuable than what you started with. How many of you in here work out? Not me. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I hear crickets chirping out there. But you know that working out is something that, like, okay, I can't go over here to extreme and bust out about 12 hours worth of bench press and be good for the year, right? I mean, I'll probably make it about 15 minutes and I'll be dead. You know that you've got to take, in order for that to pay off, in order to get yourself into shape, you can't just go once. You've got to do a little bit at a time over a long piece of time. And if you invest that time, because here's the thing, this word is important, investing, because here's the thing you cannot do with time. You can't save it. You can't make it. You can't create it. You aren't in charge of it. It's not yours to take. You can only spend it and everybody gets the same amount. You hear people say, well, she's got way more time than I do. No, she doesn't. She has 24 hours and you've got 24 hours. You spend yours differently. We all have the same amount of time. It's a great equalizer. So if you're spending it, there's only one or two ways to do spending. Right? There's the way I do it and the way my wife does it. <laughs> I'm teasing. There's wasting and there's spending in wisely, which would be investing. Investing and wasting. Okay? You're either spending it on something good or you're spending it on something you really don't need. Would everybody agree to that? For the most part. I mean, there's a few little benign things, okay, I, you know, that really aren't that critical. But for the most part, with time, when it goes to that, you're investing it into something that is important or you are investing it into something that is not important. Here's number two. Neglect adds up to. How many people have ever stuck their head in the sand and ignored a problem? <laughs> I'm like the king. I got a hat that says that. I ignore problems. Like, you know, there, I can remember a particular season in my life where um, I got kicked out of an apartment. <laughs> We, there's only one way you do that by not paying rent. It's because you just ignored the fact that you owe rent. You put your head in the sand. It got too overwhelming, and you neglected it. But maybe it's not something that serious. Maybe it's the fact that, okay, you um, could spend some time right now with your son, but you don't. That doesn't really matter today if you don't hang out with him a whole lot. You know? But the problem is, is in the United States, the average for Americans, this is, this is an amazing statistic, Americans in the United States, between Monday and Friday, who work for a living, men spend seven minutes a day with their kids, on average, statistically, in this, in this country. Seven minutes. And we wonder what's going on with them. Why are they so jacked up? No one with any sense is around them. <laughs> Moms come in, at a, they, they double it up, a whopping 13. So we're not spending time with our kids. Where, where are they we're spending time with it. We're neglecting them, and neglect adds up to, if I stop hanging out with my kid today, well, that might not have a big deal. i got something going on. Today really doesn't matter, but if you keep doing that, piling that up, and you never hang out with your kid, you're going to get to the spot where a lot of people do. You find out that your kid doesn't want to hang out with you anymore. They get to like 13, you're like, they're like, drop me off a block up the road. Like, Don't drop me off here, mom, right? And I remember doing it, like embarrassed. Neglect adds up to. Number three, Investing in random things instead of the important things adds up to, everybody say that word, 
nothing. It adds up to nothing. Let's say you were going to go to the gym like we were talking about, right? Let's say you decide to sleep in instead. At the end of a year of sleeping in, what have you got to show for it? Nothing. Like, you know, a sore back probably. <laughs> what, what do you got for a year of taking away from the things that are important? Now, think about the things that are important. Is it more important this or that? Is it more important that you... Spend 15 minutes on social media this afternoon when you get out of the car when you could really be spending 15 minutes just, what if you took that 15 minutes that you were investing in those relationships and invested it into your relationship with a human being that's sitting next to you that is your spouse? Because I think, that, you know, how many of you have been to a doctor's office without a phone? <laughs> you are a lonely person in a place like that. <laughs> While everybody's pecking away at all these relationships, we're incredibly connected and we're incredibly aware of time, except we ignore this huge fact. All the relationships in our life are going down the tubes because we don't take away from what's not important. We put it into the random and we take away from the important. After a year of ministry, the thing that I've learned uh, in my previous place was I, I, I dove off into my work and I thought, man, God, give this to me. Psh, I'm going. And, and what I figured out, folks, is is I sacrificed time with my family to do that. And look, God, your first calling as a pastor is always to your wife. And, and, I, and, I, and I, what I started to do was get into a spot where what's important in my life become idolatry. <laughs> if you want to know what's important with somebody, follow them around for 24 hours. You'll find out. What if I were to follow you around for 24 hours? I could tell you what's important in your life. It's what we do. So... If we were taking away from time to do silly things, to take away, to take away from good things, it adds up to nothing. Number four, you cannot get back what you lost because you invested in nothing. If you do nothing, if you invest in nothing, if you sit in front of an Xbox 12 hours a day, you will get nothing. You get nothing. You can't go back and fix that. If I don't hang out with Owen for the next 15 years, when he's 25, he's going to go, stick it. Dad, I don't want to hang out with you. You didn't have anything to do with me. You can't go back and fix that. If I smoke my whole life, I can't go back and get myself a new pair of lungs. That was something that I put into that was neglect and negative, and I can't go back and fix that. There are things that you need to take care of right now in your life that are having an accumulative value, and that's either positive or it's nothing. What about if you stick the 15 minutes that you woke up this morning? What's the first thing that you grabbed and checked? Guilty. Your phone. What if you took that time as a, your devotional time? Could you imagine what you would know about the Bible if you could read it for three minutes a day? Just three minutes. We're not talking about having a big expound. I mean, just three minutes. You know, I mean, you'd probably make it through four or five verses. Three minutes a day. At the end of a year, you'd have a huge value. You'd be in a closer relationship with the Lord through his word. And yet what we do is we focus on all this other stuff. It's a distraction. It's put there for a reason. It's put there for a reason. So that you'll get distracted on what you're not supposed to be focusing on. And so good people sometimes get caught up doing good things that God didn't give you. And that's what I was doing. I was, I was picking up things all over the place. And, and that needs to be done. And I can tell you, well, no one else is going to do it. I better pick it up. And the next thing I knew, I was walking around with a whole lot of things that nobody gave me but myself. And I picked up. And I took away from what God gave me. And here's, here's the crucial thing. I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable. The day uh, that I left that place, uh, Melissa, uh, she posted a picture of me. I was asleep at about two in the afternoon. I was asleep in a chair, a wingback chair. And she said, I don't think he slept in a year. He's asleep, can you believe that? And that dude, that crushed, that hit me with a ball bat. Because what I realized was I had taken away from what God had given me. Dude, God, if you're sitting next to your spouse, God gave you that. You've got kids with you in your life. Your provisions, the things that are around you that are important in your life that God gave you is where you're going to find satisfaction at. It's where you're going to find your joy at. And so when you're doing all these other things that don't matter, there's no joy in that. There's no happiness in that. It's just things to keep you busy and occupied so that you're not joyful, satisfied, fulfilled. And that was me. And so I spent a lot of time doing these silly little things like, you know, worrying about the paint color when all these relationships could have been 
poured into. So the question I've got for you today is this. Where do you need to make a few time deposits? You can only spend your time, waste it, or, or invest it. Where do, you make it. where do you need to make a couple of investments? Now, I want you to pull this story back out that I, I was telling you a few minutes ago. I want you to talk about the, um, what makes you feel alive. I used to feel alive by jumping out of a plane. <laughs> I don't jump out of a plane so much anymore. Um, I got saved, and it's really scary. And it's, you know, I was really trying to be cool. It's not important. You know, I took $7,000 out of my retirement at 38. Brilliant. Brilliant move. But since I've been saved, something happened. God replaced what's in here. He gave me a different heart. He gave me different desires. He gave me a different mind to think, okay, look, I don't really care about that anymore. That's not what's important to him. The everlasting to everlasting is what's going to last. Everything around you that you see, everything at your house, everything, your car, your clothes, your, everything is going to decorate a landfill in less than 100 years. Those things aren't important, folks. The relationships that you've got, your spouse, your wife. If you're not in a relationship, if you're in here today and, dude, you're on your own, your relationship with Christ is important. Your relationship with the Scripture is important. Your relationship with this church, you're important to us. What are you pouring into? Nothing? Extreme value, okay? So Jesus knew that he had to make a few shifts in his life. He knew he was going to shift from a transition period where he was in the ministry for three years, that he was going to transition to a period where his odometer was going to hit pause for a second and then go on for eternity. He knew that that period would come. He, he foretold it. And he talked about it all the time. And, and, and we know it's going to come too. We just don't face the fact. The key to it here is in, in verse 12, uh, verse, I'm sorry, it's uh, chapter 90, verse 12. He tells us how to do this. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Why? Why do you want to be wise about it? It says, teach you to number your days. That's not so you, hey, don't go home and download that clock. It's not going to help you any. But if you live your life as if your days were numbered, as if you didn't wake, wake up tomorrow and just, you're not going to leave out of here and know for a fact that you're going to make it another 40 years. We don't know that. We're not privileged with that information. Are you living with your spouse, your loved ones? Are you in your life in a way that if you left here tomorrow, that those people would know how you felt about them? That those relationships would be where they need to be? I mean, you know, have you left that argument open for how long? You haven't talked to who in how long? If you left here tomorrow, there's things unsaid. There are people in here right now that they have other people that they need to reach out to. There's some time investments that they can make. As a church, what can we invest in? Some time investments, our young, our youth, they're going to go past us. They're going to be in everlasting to everlasting. How about your relationship with Christ and whether or not you're a believer? Because look, all of it only matters as we close up for shift. The only reason you're going to get all this time back, the only reason that you're trying to streamline your life, the only reason that all these tips even matter is because this time isn't yours to spend, it's God's. You have a purpose in your life. And so what we want to do here is we're about to take communion. And as we move into this time of communion, I want you to reflect upon your life. Because Jesus knew that his time would end here as a man. He gives us one other word here to, to remember in, in Ephesians. He says, walk in wisdom. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then don't be foolish. Understand what the will of the Lord is. You want to understand what you're supposed to do in your life? 99% of it is here. The other percent of it, or 0.9% of it, is what you're putting your time into. It's either for him or not. That's what it's all about, okay? And he, he knew that that time would end, and it was going to end for us, and he left us a way to remember him through the sacrament of, of communion. So... If the guys want to come forward as we transition into this time, we're going to pray over these elements and we're going to ask, if you're a believer and you want to take communion with us, we invite you to do that. We want you to do that. And, and um, I just, it's a really reverent time. It's a time where we're closest. This is the body and the blood of Christ that he set forth. In the, in the book of Luke, he, he reads this story. And I'm going to pray over this real quickly and I'm going to read you the story while they pass this out. 
And we're going to take a few moments just of silence while they continue passing this out. And I want you to reflect on your life. Where do you need to make some deposits? Where are you um, having some negative areas that you maybe are random areas that you're spending time on that you can pull away from and go back to the important? What are the five important people in your life? Jesus had 11 important people, his disciples, and he served this beautiful ceremony. And he says some really important things that I'm going to read to you in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you. If you'll please stand as we prepare to take communion. And I'll pray over this. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would come into our presence in a big way as we remember that our time is not your time. Our ways are not your ways. We want to be like you. We want to do it your way. We want to stop thinking about our time and use it as yours. And the best way we can do that is in fellowship with you. And thank you, Jesus, for creating a way that we can do that through communion. Father, I ask that you bless these elements as we get ready to take your body and your blood. And we remember in this special moment what it exactly is we're holding in our hands and what that means to us personally. It's in Jesus' name.